Good morning, church. God is good, isn't he? He's good all the time. I was just thinking, I'm so joyful to be part of a church that's compassionate. Amen? And not just in words, but in deeds as well. Edelina and I have a little girl that we sponsor also in the Dominican Republic. And we have her picture at the door, on the door that we use the most. So every time we see her, see her picture, we say a prayer. I have her picture in my office, so we say a prayer. So these children are taken care of, and they pray for, and they're presented the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it's amazing, and you are part of what God is doing around the world. So personally, I'm looking forward to my next trip to the Dominican Republic, we have to go back and finish that, that chapel, that school that we were building on my last trip. And I want to meet this girl, and I want to meet her family. To me, that will be the icing on the cake. So thank you so much for being compassionate. Jesus always showed compassion to people in need. Now, this morning, I'm going to ask you to open up your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 18 and go to the very Last verse there. In Spanish, Primera de Reyes, capítulo 18, versículo 46. So go to the very last verse in First King, and we're going to take off running from there. But before we do that, I want to remind you that we are in this series. I call it a mini-series because that's what it is. Really, we need about six, eight months to Take a step by step, but you are you guys are amazing because I hear that pastor, you went so fast last week. You were Speedy Garcia last week, and you went over so many things. But you know what I did? I went back home and I got in the Bible. I went back home and I started digging in there. That's what I'm talking about, people. That's what we want, that you go back and you study even more and you get into God's Word. So I'm rejoicing that this is happening. A miracle took place last week because if you know, believe it or not, we completed, except for one verse, two chapters of the Bible in less than 48 minutes. Miracles are taking place. Today we need another miracle, by the way. But in 1 King, we're going to be reading it soon. But let, let me just remind you that this series we've entitled The Days of Elijah. The Days of Elijah. And last, last week we saw that God had to intervene in the nation of Israel. God had to bring a change. God had to do a shift so that the people will come back to God. So there was a divine intervention by God. But today, I want us to see that God brings renewal. There is a way to renewal. There is a way for refreshing, renewing, and reviving. And as we continue with our mini-series, I want to remind you what the days of Elijah should remind us every day. You ready? Are you ready? The days of Elijah should remind us Watch this. That no matter how dark the night might get, God has not left himself without a prophetic word, without a prophetic voice. The days of Elijah shout out to us that even when the, the eclipse of evil has reached its totality in this world, and it looks like sin, evil, wickedness are going to extinguish the light of the gospel, God's divine fire of holiness Mercy, grace, and forgiveness will still shine through. So do not lose hope. I'm going to ask you to remain seated. We're going to pray, and we're going to go through the whole chapter, chap uh, the last verse of eight, uh, chapter 18 and the whole chapter of verse 19. So make sure you have your spiritual seatbelt on this morning. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many children that are being helped around the world, who are being shown compassion and not just any compassion, God's compassion. Thank you that they get to hear the gospel in their own language. Thank you that they get to eat. Thank you that they get care and their families and friends get to know about Jesus. And thank you that we're partnering together with you when we do this. Now as we get into your word, Father, 
We ask you that you prepare our hearts, our minds, and our hands so that we will be not just hearers of your word, but doers of your word. Now, church, join me in this prayer. Father, speak to me. I will listen, and I will obey. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we got to meet the prophet of power. Last week, we got to meet the prophet of God, the man of God, the man of power. But today, we get to see the same man, but we don't see his power. We see his humanity. We see the humanity of the man of God. Today, we see that the best men are at best, man at best. Now, I find this interesting because if you know your Bible, and I know this church does, it's called Mayfair Bible for a reason. We love the Word of God. We love the Bible. We study the Bible. We teach the Bible. We, treat, we, we preach the Bible. And I know you do that. The New Testament has a commentary of what we learned about last week. It's found in the book of James. You don't have to go there. I'm just going to read it quickly. But if you know anything about the Bible, you know this, that the best commentary for the Old Testament is the New Testament. The best commentary for the Old Testament is the New Testament. Listen to what James says in chapter 5. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And here he talks about Elijah. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Now, there's several things I like to say about that, but I'm not preaching about that this morning. I'm just going to point out two things about what he says here. Number one, it says that Elijah was just as human as you and I are. He had the same nature that we have. So this is interesting because a lot of times we say, well, only Elijah can do that. And God says, you know, he was just as human as you are. And secondly, it says that Elijah's power source is the same as ours today. And I want you to take that with you. I want you to remember that as we go through this mini-series, that Elijah had the same nature. He was just as human as you and I, and his power source is the same one that we have today. But I want to ask you, soon we're going to find out, where do we find Elijah today? Where do we find this prophet who defied, who defeated, and who destroyed the false prophets? Where do we find this prophet that repaired the altar of God, that reminded the people of God who they were and whose they were, and who told them to cry out to God, and you know what else he did? He retired permanently all the false prophets. Where do we find them today? I'm going to tell you right now, be ready. We find them running for his life. So since you have your spiritual seatbelt on, and I don't, I just want you to know you better be ready because we're going to be doing some running today. Not literally, okay? I don't want you to get confused. But we're going to see the man of God running, and not just running, but running for his life. Now, there is a difference when you just run for fun. There's a difference when you pretend to be running at the gym. Mm -hmm. There is a difference when you, you're running because you want to get in shape, right? Some of us try that for a couple of days, and then we give up. There is a difference when you do all of that, but when you're running for your life, you're running because your life depends on it. So today, we're going to try to answer the question, this question. Follow me now. What triggers a traumatic, tragic turn around? What is the cause? What triggers this traumatic, tragic turn around? So let me prepare you as we run with Elijah. Look at verse 46 in chapter 18. The first thing I want you to see this morning is that Elijah runs to Jezreel. 
And the Bible says, Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Now, if you just casually read that, you might just move too quickly and you miss out what really happens here. Last week we saw that Ahab, the king, got in a chariot and he was going to Jezreel. But here, the power of God comes upon Elijah and he actually outruns the chariot. Now, I know we got some runners here. I'm not going to name you, but I know who you are. I don't think you could do this. I don't care what kind of shoes you have on. I don't care what kind of gear you got on. I don't think you could possibly outrun horses, especially if you're running for 18 to 20 miles. So let me say the way that cartoons say it. Believe it or not, the Bible says it's true. It is true. It is amazing. It is something that cannot be explained except from the supernatural. This man outran horses for 18 to 20 miles. Now, I want you to know that I used to be a runner. I know I don't look it now, but I used to. And when I was younger, I was pretty fast. I ran fast in the Navy. And when I, when I was in Connecticut, my wife and I were members of this gym that was a little old. So they had new treadmills and they had old treadmills. The new treadmills, as you know, for your safety, they only go up to 10 miles an hour. But the old ones, I think they went up to 12 miles an hour. So I wanted to prove myself. And I, I said, these new treadmills, they don't do anything for me. So when I went and I got on the old treadmill and I put it on speed 12. And here goes Speedy Garcia. Doom, 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 the bionic Garcia. Doom, doom, doom. I mean, I'm running. I'm running. And I kid you not, my wife is my witness. The treadmill started smoking. <laughs> smoking came out. And I'm telling my wife, look what I did. And she, they're going to charge you for the treadmill. You broke it. Now, Elijah here runs to Jezreel. I mean, it, 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 it is amazing, believe it or not, but even though he supernaturally outruns a chariot and he gets to the royal capital city of Jezreel, there's no indication in the Scripture, there is no record that God is the one who sent Elijah to Jezreel. Follow me, because in chapter 17 and in chapter 18, it was very clear. The word of the Lord came to Elisha, go here. The word of the Lord came to Elisha, go there. The word of the Lord came to Elisha, show up to Ahab. And everything he did was done because God told him to. So Elijah, even though he didn't have a word from the Lord, he shows up there. And he's taking this action, which was in direct response to what he felt. Now, someone has put it this way. And because I couldn't put it any better, I'm just going to read it to you. For Elijah to leave the sublime, solitary summit of Carmel and go down to the sordidness of Jezreel, where Jezebel still held sway, was like Lot, who left the hills of Abraham and pitched his tent toward Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, follow this. This is really important. Elijah runs to Jezreel after the victory at Carmel after the abundance of rain, and had this incredible entrance. Could you imagine that, somebody running that fast? I know some of you might not know this, but there used to be a series in the 70s where there was a bionic man. It's Steve Austin, right? He had bionic. It, it, you think about it, he only cost $6 million. That's pretty cheap now, right? And he would run fast and all that, and we would watch that. But imagine people watching a man outrun a chariot. That's, to me, that's a pretty dramatic entrance. And now Elijah is not this unknown prophet that we saw in chapter 17, because he comes out of nowhere, shows up in chapter 17, and disappears. But now people know there's somebody that has the power to shut the heavens. He has the power to call fire to come down from heaven. And he also has the power to open the heavens so that there's abundance of rain. Actually, such rain... We will call torrential rain. Have you ever been driven, uh, driving and it's raining so hard that you have to pull over to the side? Can I see your hand? 
I mean, because if you keep driving, you're going to run into somebody. That's the kind of rain that we're seeing. So there he is. But because Elijah was doing this, and Elijah was doing this apart from the word of the Lord, he's going to have to descend from triumph to tragedy. And that he would trigger the most epic, the most tragic, the most traumatic turnaround in the whole pages of Scripture. He's going to have to learn, and we also better learn, and we do well learning, that number one, the highest is usually followed by the lowest. Think about that. It's throughout the whole Bible. The highest is usually followed by the lowest. We see it here. We see it in the New Testament. I'll just give you quickly one example. You remember that time when Jesus asked that question, who do people say that I am? And some disciples, oh, some people say you're Elijah. Some people say you're a prophet. But whom do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed art thou, Simon, Peter, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I am telling you, I could just ima imagine Peter with a hag about this big. Hey, guys, did you hear what Jesus said? I'm blessed. Did you hear what Jesus said? The Father in heaven revealed that to me, not to you. Did you hear? And just follow immediately after that, Jesus began to explain that he had to go to Jerusalem to suffer and die. And you know what? The same guy that was up there at the highest, now he comes to the lowest because he said, no, Jesus, come here. We're not going to allow you. God forbid you do this. And Jesus had to tell Peter, depart from me. Get thee behind me, Satan, Satan, because you seek not the things of God but of the flesh. Let me tell you, Peter went from the highest to the lowest. Elijah is going from the highest to the lower. He's going from spiritual victory to a defeat right here. This is something we got to learn. Your life as a believer, and even in the Old Testament, the believer's life is not one that goes from mountain top to mountain top to mountain top to mountain top. I used to play video games when I was a child in Puerto Rico. There was a video arcade. I'm too old to have all the stuff you have. If we had Atari, that was wow. And I used to go play video games, and there was a game that was called Donkey Kong. Anybody played that before? And Donkey Kong would jump, dun, 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 <coughs> jump, right? And they would come on up, and he, <coughs> he was jumping from one thing. Some people think that that's the Christian life. That you're going from mountain top to mountain top to mountain top, and, and, and you don't face any adversity, you don't face any trial, you don't face any depression. Let me tell you, between mountain top and mountain top, there is a valley. But I'm here to tell you that the God of the mountain top is the God of the valley. And we have to understand that. I'm going to do my very best to explain this, explain this reality. Sometimes we don't understand it. And I got people who call me, and they say, Pastor, I don't know what's happening to me. Something's wrong with me. I, I think I'm down in the gut. I'm out there on the gutter. I, I'm done. I don't know what to do. And I said, well, explain to me what's happening. But you see, I went to this retreat, and when I was at the retreat, it was like I was walking up there with the angels. You ever had that experience? And now that Elevate didn't have that experience because they, they were raking and they were wishing they had supernatural strength like Elijah. And now they can't even walk and never mind run. And, and I felt like that. And then I got back home. And I don't know. I, I must have missed something. I said, time out. Time out. Reality is not mountaintop to mountaintop, cloud 9, cloud 10, cloud 11. No, 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 no. Sometimes we don't understand that when we come down from the mountaintop, normal, normal, feels like a low. It's just natural. Normal feels like a downer. It feels like a disappointment. It feels like a letdown, but it's just a norm. So don't beat yourself up. Don't beat yourself up thinking that it's the end of the world. The reality is, yeah, we were worshiping God. Yes, we were singing. Yeah, we witnessed uh, God's people getting saved, children being reached out, people getting baptized. But 
Let me just put it this way. It was Sunday, and now tomorrow is going to be Monday. That's it. We got to learn that. Because if you don't, you have no answer, and you will be deceived thinking that there are no valleys between mountaintops. So Elijah runs to Jezreel. Number two, Elijah runs from Jezebel. Now, I mentioned this lady last week, and some of you got mad at me. I know who you are. I mentioned her, and I said that she was a bad, wicked person. You should read some of the commentaries. They just call her the worst Woman in the Bible, the wicked, the, the, the baddest woman in the Bible. She was not bad in the good sense. She was just bad. So look at verses, uh, chapter 19, verses 1 through 3. Elijah runs from Jezebel. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also that he had executed all the prophets with the sword. They got terminated by the sword. Then Jezebel sent the messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me, and more so, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, the, he saw that, this is a very important verse, and when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life, and he went to Beersheba, which belongs, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. This is what's going on. Ahab makes it to Jezreel, where they had their capital city there, the kingdom of the north. That's where they had their kingdom. And he brings a report to Queen Jezebel. And you would think that when Queen Jezebel gets a report, you should have been there. I seen the fire of God come down. I seen how that man defeated all the false prophets. Not only that, look, it is raining like crazy, torrential rain. I mean, you would think that Jezebel would say, wow, he must be a man of God. Wow, God must be on his side. Wow, there is no God like Jehovah. But no. She did not repent. In fact, I see some of that in our day and time because people, I will go and preach the gospel or present the gospel one-on-one -on -one to a person. I just let them know. We all have sinned, fallen short of God's glory. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. If you repent, come to Christ. He will receive you. He will give you eternal life. And you know, I said, well, just prove it to me. I said, I said what do you need? If you could just show me somebody that has been dead and come back to life, produce that for me. I will receive your Christ. I said, I need not do that. He is risen. He is not dead. Jesus rose. But they believe it not. And similarly, Jezebel did not get intimidated. Did you notice that? She didn't get intimidated that Elijah defeated 850 prophets. Instead of getting intimidated, she got infuriated. Hmm. Ever met somebody like that? She got mad. And when she got mad, she sent a deadly serious message. Apparently, it must have been with the messenger. I don't know. I was thinking like before texting and faxing and email. People used to send telegrams and somebody would go and read the message. I don't know. But this is even before that. And he says that she sent this serious deadly message. And he said, I'm just going to paraphrase it. You are just as dead as my prophets are. And this is what I swear to you that by tomorrow, you're going to be dead. D-E-A-D. Dead, dead, dead. And verse 3 tells us what happened. He got up, Elijah, and ran for his life all the way to the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, you think he ran 18 to 20 miles? Now he's going about 78 to 80 miles. And Elijah is in despair. He had neglected to rest. So when he neglected to rest, fear took over. And not only did fear take over, but fatigue takes over. And now he's in despair and depression. This is where we find Elijah now. So when he gets to, to, to running from Jezebel, he then runs to the wilderness. Look at verse 4. Elijah runs to the wilderness. Follow this. Elijah runs to Jezreel. Elijah runs from Jezebel. And Elijah runs then to the wilderness. Verse 4. 
But he, that's Elijah, himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. Some of your translation may say juniper tree. And he prayed. That sounds exciting, right? But look at what he prayed. And he prayed that he might die. Man, that doesn't sound very spiritual, does it? He prayed that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life for I'm no better than my father's. Now, that's a critical point right there. That's where the intensity goes up a level. That's when if you were doing a movie, you will stop it right there and have people wait till next week to show what really happens. Right? He's just praying to God to take his life. Now, I told you there was going to be a miracle, and this is the miracle. I'm going to tell you in less than a minute, time me if you want to, a whole book of the Bible. Because I find some similarities between what happened to Elijah and what happened to another prophet, Jonah. Because he also, at the end of his book, cries out, God, kill me. He wasn't happy. But here it is. Get your clocks ready, or your watches, or your timers. I'm going to tell you the whole book of Jonah in less than one minute. Ready, set, go. Jonah ran from God. Number two, Jonah, boom, runs right into God. Number three, Jonah runs with God. And number four, Jonah wants to run God. And here's Elijah running from Jezebel, runs into the desert, to the wilderness, and we find him under a broom tree. Look what happens. Then as he lay and slept under the broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him. Touched by an angel right there. An angel touched him right there and said to him, arise and eat. Then he looked and there by his head was a cake baked on coals. And my wife told me the first cake that you find in the Bible is an angel cake right there. And a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time. And touched him and said, arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. Now let me tell you what I learned from Elijah. He was a survivalist. He could survive. He went and I learned this from the, from the broom tree, from the juniper tree. I don't know if you ever watched those series of people that they put them in the wilderness or they take them to Alaska way up there and they, we'll leave you here. We'll come back for you if you're not dead in 40 days. Have you seen that? And they have to find ways to survive. Let me just show you here. A broom tree shows me that he was a survivalist because not only did you get some shade. By the way, it's, it's more like a desert bush. You cannot really stand under a, brush, uh, a broom tree. You have to lay down, and yeah, you get some shade. But look, there is sufficient moisture and nourishment in a juniper tree to keep death at bay for one or two days. Did you know that? Well, you should have because it's in the Bible. Job, 30, write that down. I'm not going to read it, but Job 30, 1 through 4 tells you that. So if you knew your Bible and they throw you in the desert, hopefully you know how to get to a juniper tree. It's also the place... Listen, it shows me his survival skills, but it also shows me the place where his depression, and we're getting serious now, where his depression is made manifest. He said, Brother Garcia, how depressed was he? He prayed that he might die. Lord, please kill me. Now, I want you to see that the, how the Lord deals with Elijah. And how he begins to pave a way of renewal, to pave the way for refreshing, for renewing and reviving. First, God deals with Elijah physically. He lets him sleep. I know some of you guys like to sleep in church. We know who you are. We got your picture. We posted it. I remind you, it is dangerous to sleep in church because Adam fell asleep and when he woke up, he was married. So be careful. That's right. And God lets us sleep. If you wonder why we don't wake you up when you fall asleep, but we just let you sleep. You probably need it more, right? He lets us sleep. 
And look, he's touched by an angel. I want that touch, right? And, and God feeds him. God hydrates him. He, he has some angel cake that God prepared. Then the same process is repeated once again. Now, sometimes you have neglected yourself because you're always taking care of someone else. And then you feel like you don't, no longer have a life. Listen to me, parents. I know what you're talking about. I have been there. I'm a grandpa now, but I used to have my little girls. And you feel like you don't have a life anymore because if it's not the football game, it's a soccer game or it's a softball game or it's the volleyball game. And you got to go to the rehearsal or you got to go to the practice. And if you don't show up for practice, your child doesn't get to play. Anybody following me here? And you're running around like a chicken with his head cut off, right? And you work, on top of that, you're working so hard that you neglect to rest. And you're burning the candle on both ends, not realizing that when you burn the candle on both ends, you're not as bright as you think. And while all this is going on, because you haven't rested, because you probably haven't even eaten, preparing meals for others, Anxiety begins to turn into fear, fatigue, and it begins to conquer your quiet place where you need to be. You see, Elijah had forgotten that God's presence was with him under the juniper tree just as much as his presence was at Carmel. You going through that? You got so much going on? Call somebody. Call out for help. Say, I need help. I haven't had a chance to cook. Did you make any rice? Do you have any tortillas? Do you have any flan? I'm sorry, that's what I eat, so that's what you get. <laughs> But please do yourself a favor and ask somebody to help you out. You know, it just tickles me to be sad. It was actually an angel cake that the Lord made for him. Now, who is this angel? I'm moving real fast now. It's called in verse 7, the angel of the Lord. Now, this is really important. Could this be a, what in theology we call a theophany, a Christophany, and let me explain that. This is when God in the Old Testament shows himself, this an appearance of God before the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Was this the person of God himself in disguise? Write this verse down, Isaiah 63, 9. I believe that the angel of his presence, the angel of the Lord that appears to Elijah is no other than a Christophany. And it's kind of like what happened 950 years later <laughs> at, at, the, at the Lake of Galilee where the disciples were at the, uh, fishing there and Jesus shows up and he says, hey guys, are you hungry? I got some food for you here. Let me tell you, sometimes the best thing you could do when you feel depressed, when you feel stressed out, when you feel that there is no peace because anxiety and fear have eaten out your peace, is to take a break and say, I got to rest. It's to just go to sleep and let somebody bake you some cake. It's, to, it's just to simply say, you know, I need to take a time out. And I love it here that God takes care of Elijah personally. See, Elijah could have just been, God could have just been telling God, Elijah, what is, what's going on? And beat him up right over the head. But then, number four, Elijah runs to the Mount of Horeb. Now, Mount Horeb is also known as Mount Sinai. So I'm just going to move real quickly here. Verse 8. So he arose and ate and drank. And here's something supernatural here too. And he went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. Let me go jump to verse, uh, make it quicker for you, 11. Verse 10, I'm sorry. So he said, God comes in, uh, Elijah is hiding in this cave. And in verse 10, He tells the Lord after he asked him, what are you doing here? What are you doing? So he, he has this caveman mentality. I know some of you have what you call, this is my man cave. That's not what I'm talking about. That's okay. I think I have my own man cave. But this is talking about a mentality of, of somebody who is going through a depression, who is, is, is ready to say, I'm ready to give up. I'm ready to resign. I'm ready to throw the towel. And God comes in and says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And in verse 10, he has this reply. So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Notice the response. 
Because God begins to deal now in a whole different setting. Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. I call that a whisper. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the presence of, in the entrance of the cave. He obeyed God. Suddenly, a voice came to him and said, check it out. What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, how many of you know that when God asks you, when God asks you a question, he already knows the answer? He's not asking to get information from you. He's asking to help you. He's asking to bring you to a point of, realize, uh, of understanding where you are. And he said again, look, the same thing. I'm very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Now, this is how God deals with them. Then the Lord said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive... Number one, anoint Hazael, king of Assyria. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as the king of Israel. And number three, Elijah, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Meolah, you shall anoint as the prophet in your place. And I'm going to just have you read the rest at home because I know I'm moving real fast. Now, notice how God deals with Elijah. He deals with him mentally. And spiritually. He goes in this cave and demonstrates this mentality of a caveman. And when you have this mentality, you only think about yourself. I alone. They're seeking my life. No one else is with me. Does that sound familiar? I mean, sometimes we, we are so tired, so fatigued, and maybe things are happening be, beyond your control. And you think you're the only one who's going through it. Let me tell you. You're not alone. There are a lot more people going through it. And when you have this mentality, you think you're the only one. And you know what he does? He keeps on digging, digging. The cave is getting deeper and deeper and more profound. Let me tell you, if you want to get out of a cave, stop digging. Because the more you dig, the harder it is to get out. So God has to find a way to get him out and have him to stand before the Lord. And God does something amazing. Because there's a strong wind like a hurricane breaking rocks. And there is fire. And there is uh, most, there's all these things that are happening here. There's the, the wind, the earthquake, and the fire. But God is not in any of these things. He said, well, wait a minute. Wasn't God in the fire when he was at Mount Carmel? Yes, he was. Wasn't God in the wind when he opened the Red Sea for the people of Israel? Yes, he was. And wasn't God using the earthquake when Jesus died and, and there was an earthquake and everybody realized something amazing happened here? Yes, God does that. But most of the time, God chooses to speak to us through, through a still, small voice. And Elijah, at this point, standing before God, God confronts him, and then God gives him a new assignment. So you're already with me. He's going to anoint two kings, and then he's going to anoint Elijah as his replacement. Now, basically, that's what I use when I mentor somebody, what God has done right here. I'll give it to you this way. Accountability, affirmation, assessment, and assignment. God brings to Elijah, what are you doing here? Think about that question. How many times could God possibly ask that question of us? Maybe when you're holding the remote control and you're about to change that channel, you might hear that still small voice. What are you doing there? Maybe when you're going to click on that link or that text that somebody sent you, or you're about to send something to somebody, once you send it, you can't get it back. What are you doing? What are you doing here? Well, yes, I'm going to conclude with this illustration, true story. The person shall remain nameless. I don't think any of you would know except my wife who this person is. But when I was planting the Spanish church, and as the worship thing comes up, please. There was a mother that was so depressed that she was so exhausted 
that she was so bummed out that she tried to take her life. So they called me and they told me, you got to go to McLaren's. She's in the psych ward. She doesn't know you're showing up. So when I went to see her and she saw me, she literally threw herself on the floor. No, I didn't want you to see me here. I didn't want you. I mean, it was, it was like people came out to see if, I, if, she was, if she needed help. I said, I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to help you. I'm here to let you know that you're not alone. She started crying. She was beyond. And, and you know, I found out what the problem was. She said, my kids are being bullied, bullied at school. And she felt helpless that she couldn't do anything about it. So, you know, I said, let's, let's do something. When you get out of here, because I know you will, I'm going to give you an assignment. You're going to go to a school that your children go to and ask permission for me to show up. With my, at that time, I had a police chaplain uniform. For me to show up with my police uniform at school. And then I'm going to go around the, the classrooms where your children attend. And she said, okay. So she, I gave her an assignment. And when she got out, we did that. And when I showed up to school, my wife came with me. We went room by room. Did you know that that day the bullies didn't show up? So you said, well, Brother Garcia, what a waste of time. Pastor Garcia, you really blew it. No, because I heard afterwards that all the children were saying, ooh, nobody mess with that boy because he's got people that really care for him. And when the bullies came back the next day, they started telling the story of what had happened. But this lady came out of depression because she had a purpose and an assignment to do. I want you to see that just like there was a tragic, traumatic turnaround of fear, fatigue, and depression, there was also a grace, faithful, triumphant turnaround. Now let me ask you, where are you today? Are you worn out just by life? Are you cast down? Are you depressed? Are you like the psalmist? Some people say, but Christians don't get depressed. Have you read the book of Psalms? Have you heard David say, when, I'll be saying in Spanish and I'll interpret, cuando mis lágrimas fueron mi pan día y noche, when my tears became my bread day and night. Talk about deep, profound sorrow and depression. Are you worn out? Are you burning the candle on both ends? Are you helping others and neglecting yourself? Do you feel like you don't have a life because you live in someone else's life or your children are actually living your life for you? Do you realize that it's time to stop digging? That it's, stop, it's time to stop making the cave bigger? You must stop digging. It's time to stand before God and get really close. Quickly, notice that the same question was given to Elijah twice. The first time he was inside the cave, what are you doing, Elijah? He didn't come out. But when God then gets him to come out, the same question came. Same question. What's the difference? This time, God whispered it. You know what happens when you whisper? ¿Sabes lo que pasa con you know what happens you gotta you gotta get really close get close so you can hear Elijah drew near to God God affirmed him God held him accountable God told him what was going on he assessed him and gave him an assignment have your tears become your bread day and night is your pillow dry at night but wet with your tears in the morning Get out of the cave. Stand before God for renewal. Let God refresh you with his word. Let him affirm you by his love and hold you accountable by his presence and give you that new assignment that he has for you. In Jesus' name.